Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, M&T Bank, PBM, Customers Bank, Collins Building Services, Amtrust Title Insurance Company, Marks Paneth, Capital One Bank. Additional funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from Amarant Bank, Bank of America, Citizens Bank, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handro Properties LLC Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, John Kesmatidis Red Apple Group, Keysight Capital Partners, New Banks, Meridian Capital Group, Ocean First Bank, People's United Bank, RPW Group, TD Bank, and these friends. Near Long Island, summer camp, skiing, University of Massachusetts. Maybe I'll go to go to law school. Maybe I'll become a sports agent. Maybe you know I'll get involved. There's this new guy Cuomo. He's trying to do something. He's has a nonprofit. Maybe it's time for me to leave the nonprofit world. Found a job, created an industry, built a great real estate organization. And in between, decided to come up with beach tennis, come up with a variety of other businesses, yoga instructor, TM instructor, a great humanitarian, my friend Mark Alltime. Thanks for being here today. Thank you for having me, Michael. So tell me a little bit about your father's side and then your mother's side. So my dad is an electrician uh, by trade. His father was an electrician by trade. He told me one thing, don't become an electrician. He said, that's not the field you want to be in. My mom is a Finkelstein. She's from Brooklyn, from Crown Heights. She had a uh, nice childhood growing up in Brooklyn. They meet on a blind date because uh, my father's best friend, he got sick. So he said, Philip, I need you to take this woman, Barbara Finkelstein, to, uh, to the party. And therefore, they meet and uh, Philip becomes the suitor for Barbara from that point on. Philip's friend is not happy with him, but that became their romance at 14 and 15, which is eerily similar to my own romance with my beautiful wife, Hope, who I met in homeroom at Woodmere Junior High North in, ninth, in seventh grade. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, growing up in uh, the five towns. Tell me about your early years and the summers and everything that happened you know, before you got to, to college? Uh, the five towns, which sometimes is viewed uh, disparagingly, was an idyllic life for me. Uh, the schools, the quality of the schools were excellent. Uh, my neighborhood was great. There was roller hockey on the street. You were safe. You could ride your bike to school. You can go to Atlantic Beach. It was four miles away. It was a great lifestyle, Al Steiner's restaurant, really a cocoon of sorts, I would tell you, Michael, though. You know, growing up in the five towns, if you thought that that was the way the rest of the world was, you were sorely wrong. But while I was in the bubble, it was really a great, great lifestyle. Now, you know, as you said, when you were in the bubble, you went to summer camp and you were a good athlete, you know, short point guard, but you were a good athlete, right? Camp Winorki. Summer camp. Camp Winorki. All boys, no girls, all sports, all the time. Cut your hair, put a bowl on your head and cut your hair. My mother was not happy about that, needless to say. But the summer camp experience built sportsmanship, teamwork, competitive zeal, and uh, it was a great place to uh, spend your summers up in New Hampshire in Lake Winnipesaukee. So, what happens after camp? What do you do? 
after camp, uh, I, uh, I basically spend my summers and my high school days working, which was unusual. I was working as a busboy at a restaurant called Casablanca. And I worked three or four days a week. I was a busboy. It was great training ground, great to relate to people. And my summers were made up of basically being a busboy and having a little too much fun. Let's put it that okay, way. Okay, so how did you decide to leave the five towns and go up to Massachusetts to college? So uh, my father has had a great successful career. He was a CEO of Forest Electric. He had a great career, but he had some ups and downs. And uh, during the time when I was applying to college, uh, private colleges were not something that was affordable necessarily. It would have necessitated a loan. So my dad said, you know, if you want to go to college, you can go to a state college. Usually it's less expensive. So, and I wanted to be within driving distance. So I was lucky enough, I had some friends at University of Massachusetts in Amherst, visited the school, and it was close to the mountains of Vermont. And I said, that's a good place for me. I was also uh, a Red Sox fan already at that point. So the stars were aligned and I chose to go to UMass Amherst. Now, where was Hope during this time? Who you met in homeroom? Hope was in Ithaca College. We had gone to the ninth grade prom together and the 12th grade prom together, but we decided to healthily, you know, that's not a word, but that we decided she would go to Ithaca College. Well, she decided she would go to Ithaca College and I went to UMass Amherst. Okay, so as I was alluding before, at UMass, you, you found a new vocation? Bookmaking? Yes, I was a kid let out of a cage and I was uh, very social and I saw there was a vacuum for bookkeeping, uh, bookmaking, excuse me, uh, for, and I decided to become a bookie in my first semester freshman year. It was, it was, it was successful, but not so successful. It was really a, not the best use of my time along with some other things that I did. And it forced me to really be uh, academically uh, challenged. And I had some instances, I was actually on academic probation and uh, it, was a, it was an awakening for me. Uh, and it took a while, but I, I, I finally, at some point, righted the ship. You know, you grew up predominantly in a Jewish area in Long Island. And your roommate had never seen a Jew in his life when you first came out there. That is correct. Uh, my roommate was Michael Alex, two first names. You can never trust a man with two first names, but he was from Worcester, Massachusetts. And he told me he had never eaten a bagel and he had never really spent any considerable time with a Jewish person. And we were randomly joined together as roommates in a uh, dorm room at UMass which is good for me because coming out of the bubble was important and going to a state school where people were not of my likeness was uh, culturally necessary. So let's talk about the semester abroad. You went with your friend, Mr. Boxer. Uh, well, Mr. Boxer, Nelson Boxer, my dear friend and person who I look up to tremendously, went to the London School of Economics the, semester, the year before I went to London. He was the, the motivation for me to go to and apply to go to school. I went to the City of London Polytechnic and Nelson was the trailblazer before me. So I went there and it was a life-changing experience to see the world. And it really got me to be more serious about myself and about what the next phases in my life would include. So how did you decide to go to law school after you graduated? Uh, as I said earlier, my father uh, said, no, 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 no family business for you. So maybe you should figure out a career. And I had uh, known some lawyers and I said to myself, I had wasted considerable time, intellectual time at UMass not doing what I should have been doing and felt that the vigors of a law school would be something that I could uh, handle and that I believe would be good for me. So I got lucky and I applied to the Cardozo School of Law, which was in its infancy, and interviewed with the dean, Mr. Burt Resnick, rest in peace, arranged for an interview with Monroe Price. 
and Mr. Price and I clicked and I kind of got into the school with a little bit of favor. And, uh, you know, I did well, I did good enough. But in working with law firms during the summers, I felt that my my skill sets, my personality were not necessarily matching up with me being a good lawyer. So while the education was invaluable, I decided that I would not go into the practice of law. So what are you doing now, kid? I mean, you're not going to be an electrician. You're not going to be a sports agent. What do you do? What actually interested me in school and my father and mother also were very instrumental in this is they were very philanthropic. They realized that life is about what you give, not necessarily what you get. And I, I was very interested in the public sector and some of the classes in law school that I was turned on to involved real estate and public, uh, public works. So uh, through some friends of my father, I was able to uh, get acquainted with some people, namely Andrew Cuomo, who at the time was uh, the governor's son, who was started a not-for-profit. That not-for-profit was called HELP, Housing Enterprise for the Less Privileged. I expressed an interest in working with HELP. HELP was not fully set up yet, so Andrew had recommended maybe I wanted to work for one of the state agencies. So I ended up working for the New York State Housing Finance Agency as my first job out of law school. What followed next? And then I worked at HELP, and then Andrew went to be Secretary of HUD, and I ran the agency HELP USA at a pretty young age, where we had 300 employees, and I was actually in charge of the agency. It was a, it was a tall order. I had a great staff around me that made me look good. And I got uh, to develop affordable housing and transitional housing for homeless families while at HELP. And I had a good job. I was the executive director. It was really, really amazing. I worked with Maria Cuomo, who took over as chairwoman of HELP. But at the age of 33, 34, I had three kids. And I decided that a salary of not-for-profit was not going to be uh, enough for me to live a lifestyle that I think I wanted to live. But you, you really gained a lot of great learning and education at HELP, okay? And also housing, you know, affordable housing and, you know, supportive of housing, as they would say. You know, working day by day with Andrew Cuomo at the time, taking politics aside, just the man and his work ethic and the way he handled himself was a great learning experience for me. It was great on the job training and working with Tishman, the likes of Tishman Spire and Alexander Cooper while I was at HELP really exposed me to some great people. And when I decided to leave HELP, I started to explore working in real estate development, but my skill sets were more general than they were specific. And it wasn't really matching up with some of the jobs I was looking for. So um, really through my grandmother who was living in an assisted living residence in Florida, and we were trying to bring her back to New York, I discovered there was really a paucity of assisted living residences in New York. And I was shocked that there was all this product in Florida and not in New York. And it, a bell went off, a, a light went off in my head. And I said, you know, why can't I try to develop assisted living? And then I had a friend like you, who we became friends in that era. And you introduced me to some fellows at Coopers and Librand. And then I was fortunate enough to become friendly with this fellow, Peter Fine, who was working at the Met Council on Jewish Poverty. I told him that this is what I was thinking of doing. And he said, you know, I'm thinking of doing some stuff too. And we became partners, uh, Peter Fine and I, and we formed something called Atlantic Development Group in 1995. So, so, but you had never really done assisted living, okay? The help projects were, I mean, this is for profit. Now, how do you, you found the hotel in Ossining, New York? That was the first property? Yeah, so Peter and I put up our shingle. We called the company Atlantic Development Group. We wanted to sound bigger than we were. Uh, we said that we would try to enter into this field of assisted living. We found a hotel in Ossining that was for sale. And we quickly realized that no bank was going to finance Mark and Peter to operate an assisted living residence. So we ended up uh, starting to 
meet with people who were in the field. And we ended up doing a transaction with this fellow, Abe Gossman, from a company out of Massachusetts. And they were the operator. And we basically purchased the land. And then we did a joint venture with Care Matrix, a company from Massachusetts. And then later on, we became partners with Sunrise Assisted Living and the Kaplan Brothers. And we developed five or six assisted living residences in about three years, which was really pretty amazing that we just had decided to do it and got it done. How do you phase into the, the affordable housing business with Peter, you know, with the certificates, the tax credits and so on? So we segued into the affordable housing arena. Peter and I had had our roots in uh, supported housing in New York, homeless housing, AIDS housing. And there was an attorney, his name was Jay Seiden. And Jay Seiden and Peter, I guess, had a phone conversation or maybe it was a, a drink and a, and a conversation. And Jay introduced Peter to this idea that there was this program in New York called the 421A Certificate Program. And he felt that Atlantic would be really well suited to get into that arena. So talk about the, the initial days at Atlantic, because I still remember the small office with you and Peter sharing, you know, at 110 Plaza. And then I remember 7th Avenue, I believe, you know, there. So as I was saying, uh, Peter got exposed to this program through Jay Seiden. He, primarily my partner, hatched an idea that we could be building some of these 421A projects. We first found ourselves in a small office, me, Peter, and Barbara Perkel. Uh, my father had given us some space at Forest Electric, and then we moved into Mr. Handler's building at 561 7th Avenue. And uh, we, we really had a, like a meteor ascended really quick and got to go to city auctions and buy land on city auctions and really develop a model that was able to be duplicated and really found ourselves in a, in a frenzy in the real estate market where the, where the need for tax abatement was, need, was necessary. And we uh, developed this business and uh, we ended up doing 70 projects over a period of about 12 years. You, you were in a trip to Aruba and you heard about this thing called beach tennis? So uh, always being a sports aficionado and being a big viewer of ESPN, I noticed that ESPN was showing bowling and, you know, hopscotch and all this other stuff in the prime hours. And that coincided with a trip to Aruba when my wife and I came upon the sport of beach tennis. So um, uh, as a side venture, while I was at Atlantic, I hired some people and we decided to, to explore the possibility of bringing the sport of beach tennis to the United States. And we started a tour and we were on the tennis channel. I got to be on the show, but it was a venture that was um, hatched with great, with great expectations and great hope. But uh, while it was fun, it was not financially successful, but it was fun to say that I introduced a sport to the United States and thousands of people play it. And uh, we'll wait to see what the future brings, but beach tennis is something I play every weekend and with my buddies in Atlantic Beach. I consider myself a pretty good beach player of Kadima and Frisbee and uh, beach tennis is something I was passionate about. I gave it my all, uh, it didn't work out and uh, it's okay. So let's talk about the yoga business. When I turned about 50, Peter and I discussed that I would decide I wanted to move on from Atlantic Development Group. And I wanted to pursue some other things while he was really still interested in growing the real estate business. And I decided to first uh, become a student at the Jewish Theological Seminary, which I did for a couple of years, just to satisfy my intellectual curiosity and also my, my love of Judaism. And I did that for a couple of years. And then I've been a yoga student for the same time. And I wanted to learn more about yoga. And I took a class, I was certified as a yoga instructor. And then I decided to take it to the next level and open up a yoga studio in Manhasset, Long Island. And that's been open for a couple of years. And it's really something I'm passionate about. It gives me a way to be a healer for people. It gives me a way to help others which I really find important in my own life, selfishly. And uh, having a yoga studio has been a great experience. So I'm a, I'm a pretty good teacher, mostly for men, because I understand where men are 
in the in in challenging themselves with yoga. It's not easy. So during this pandemic, how hard is it to to run a yoga business? Uh, Michael, it's difficult. Uh, from March 20th till about May 20th, I did a virtual class every day for 44 days in a row. And people who were members of my studio and other people could watch virtually on Instagram. And it was great to teach, uh, but I was teaching to just a TV, uh, for a t uh, to a telephone. So right now the challenges are, I don't want to teach yoga with a mask on. I, yoga is a place where you go to get away from the COVID. And for now, uh, I teach virtually. I've gotten some decent feedback and people are benefiting at least from the free yoga that I'm teaching. Now, when you went to college, was Kabad important up at the University of Massachusetts? Or because I know you've been very involved with the Kabads. So uh, Chabad on campus is a program that I am on the, uh, the National Board of Trustees. And my interest in Chabad uh, came about much later than college. I, I don't even know if there was a Chabad on campus at the University of Massachusetts. My Jewish uh, awakening occurred in Israel at the wall, uh, literally at the wall. I felt that vibration and moment of light enter into me. And I started studying with Orsa Meich, and then I met some people from Chabad, Yossi Gordon, who used to run along with, I think, your friend over at the Jewish uh, Child, uh, Jewish Children's Museum. Uh, so Yossi Gordon was the development director there, and then he moved on to Chabad on campus, and I followed him. And the work of Chabad is invaluable, and it is amazing, and it is one of the main reasons that the Jewish people are able to keep their faith. So tell me a little bit about, you know, the, the young lady that you met in junior high school in homeroom and then who you got married, you know, a couple of years after college, Hope, and tell me about your daughters and your son-in-laws, you know, and your son, Robbie. My wife, who has several names, Hope, Chaya, and Esperanza, uh, and I met in seventh grade homeroom, lucky me, uh, ninth grade, we started to go out, and then we had uh, the good fortune to get married at the age of 25, and then I've been blessed with three beautiful children, two daughters and a son, and now both my daughters got married over the last uh, year, so I have two beautiful sons-in-law, and we're all under one roof in this COVID uh, thing. We, seven of us have been living together for the, since March 11th. We have been in, the, in our home in Lake Success, and it is a pure joy for me. It is the lemonade of lemonade. It has been a corona experience, which I'll never forget in a good way. I know that this has been very sad for many, but for us as a family, it's been a unique, beautiful time because we've been together harmoniously for the last seven months. At least from Hope and I, it's been harmonious. Tell me about what the girls do and then about Robbie. My son worked for uh, the Bloomberg presidential campaign and now he works for an offshoot of Bloomberg called Hawkfish. He's a very accomplished young man. He's 23 years old. Uh, my daughters are also great workers, hardworking, both in the fashion industry, stars at their company, great work ethic. They take after their mother and uh, they are stars. And both of my sons-in-law are incredibly talented and are really great role models for me because the way they handle themselves and the way they treat my daughter is beautiful. You I have a sister and brother bad. also. Tell me about them. Uh, my sister Jill is married, unbelievable girl, also a hard worker. My brother is a successful uh, entrepreneur of a not-for-profit that he runs himself. And, uh, you know, the all times have made their mark in many different ways. And I feel truly blessed for my family, for what I've been given, for, for the opportunities that I've been given, and for the opportunity to be friends with you, because we've been friends for many years. And you're my brother, and you're my uncle. Now, everything comes back to your parents. Barbara and Phil have been major people in everybody's life in the community and yours. Yeah, my parents, 
are first and foremost uh, loving people. They treat everybody, no matter what race, creed, and color, they taught me right out of the box that we're no better than anybody else and that to treat everybody with respect. And I think that was the foundation for everything for my family and for my kids. In addition, my father, whose name is Philip, is quite philanthropic, has set a great model for me to be so generous with his money and time for causes that are important. My mother is a great cook, loves music. As you can see behind me, I have these music posters. My love of music is completely through my mother. My sense of humor is completely from my mother. She is as beautiful inside as she is outside. And as you know, she's suffering from Alzheimer's now. And it's been really, 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 really brutal for our family. Well, all I can say is the family are mentions and the, the super mentions, my friend Mark, all the time. And thanks for being here today. Love you, buddy.